To be a wise leader, you have to walk the talk. You must embody it. When we embody the values and attributes, intelligence, reflective experience, emotional regulation, and compassion, then we not only contribute to human flourishing, but also experience a sense of deep satisfaction. So this lecture considers a wise disposition, acting wisely, and as a result, achieving deep satisfaction. In 1973, a famous experiment was conducted by social psychologists John Darley and Daniel Batson. They recruited 67 students from the Princeton Theological Seminary, who were told that they were required to give a brief talk nearby. Half were asked to give a talk on the types of jobs that seminary graduates could obtain, and the other were asked to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Then they were divided without their knowledge into three groups. A third were told that they were very late for the talk. Another third were told that they should hurry. And a third were told that there was no need to hurry. What the students were not told was that the experimenters had arranged for an actor to lie in a doorway where the theology students would have to pass him, bent over, coughing and in distress. So how did this experiment turn out? Overall, only 40% offered help. The biggest determinant of whether a theological student helped was the amount of hurry they were in. 63% of those who did not need to hurry, helped the man. 45% of those in a medium hurry helped. But only 10% of those who had to hurry assisted. This story provides a valuable insight into the need for wise people, wise leaders, to walk the talk. Instead of this phrase, I use the word embody because it means that a person has to actually experience a sense of goodness, or more particularly, a striving for goodness. In striving for goodness, one actually experiences a sense of harmony that leads to true happiness. This embodiment is the expression of a disposition. A disposition is a person's inherent qualities of mind and character. The idea of a wisdom disposition is not new. In his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle stated that virtue is a purposive disposition, inherent in the prudent human. Thus, virtue was understood as a set of intellectual and moral qualities. Intellectual virtues include knowledge and reasoning capability, but also non-rational capabilities, such as intuition and what we now call crystallised knowledge, knowledge built through experience. Moral virtues are enacted by the right thinking person who acts in a certain way because it is the proper thing to do in a circumstance. In other words, a virtuous person acquires virtues as part of a continual process of learning, thinking, acting and reflecting, all the time committed to the social good. Although Aristotle listed 11 virtues, they should not be considered as the last word. Nonetheless, they provide a useful checklist. Courage, temperance, generosity, magnificence, magnanimity, right ambition, good temper, friendliness, truthfulness, wit, and justice. A wise person acquires a disposition that leads them to proper action. In many cases, the person acts automatically because the values are innate within us. So, how does wisdom make us happy? Happiness is when what you think what you say and what you do are in harmony. So said Mohandas Gandhi. 
This statement leads us to an important understanding. That is, true happiness is linked with wise leadership. Aristotle's philosophy was concerned with how wisdom can produce that most desired human end, to be happy. Significantly, the term used by Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers for wisdom, eudaimonia, is now the term used by psychologists to refer to psychological well-being. Eudaimonia translates as human flourishing, according to philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Contributing to human flourishing should be the purpose of all leadership. By contrast, our contemporary Western world defines happiness primarily in terms of income and worldly goods. Yet this is simply not the case. A 2012 article by George McCarran from the London School of Economics shows that income has only a limited impact on happiness once it passes a basic level, and that factors such as good health, your neighbourhood, your labour market status, marital status, and trusting people have much more impact. One form of happiness psychologists define as subjective well-being. It is determined by how far individuals perceive that they are from their aspirations and the balance of positive and negative affect, which means a sense of feeling happy. This is a fairly shallow measure. People who feel comfortable with their life achievement and have access to material goods, a nice house, a new car and the like would score highly on subjective well-being. However, psychological well-being is quite different. Psychological well-being is more profound because it responds to a fundamental existential challenge of life. The existential challenge asks, why are we here? What is our purpose? Carol Riff, Professor of Psychology at University of Wisconsin-Madison, who has been studying this for over 30 years, has identified six characteristics of psychological well-being self-acceptance, positive relations with others, autonomy, environmental mastery, purpose in life, and personal growth. I have said that wisdom requires moral and intellectual expertise, the pinnacle of which is excellence. This excellence is seen in a person's nature, their behaviour, and their reasoning. But how is this linked to psychological well-being? Several studies have shown that people who display wise characteristics also have higher life satisfaction. For example, Monica Ardelt, a well-known US wisdom scholar, showed that those who aged most successfully, developmentally and socially, had displayed a lifelong accumulation of wisdom. Another study by Jeffrey Webster showed that those who scored highest on two separate wisdom scales positively correlated with psychological well-being. Not only do wise leaders experience psychological well-being, they help to build this well-being in others, whether they are team members or followers, because they are committed to human flourishing. In a study that I conducted with some other researchers, we found that in the case where the leader has authority over followers, personal wisdom characteristics positively affected the relationship. The followers rated the wiser leaders more highly, particularly in terms of being given individualised consideration and in communicating. Leaders who develop high quality relationships with others are more likely to be effective and those who are influenced by that leader felt more empowered. In a development context, the wise leader listens to those with whom she or he works and respects their local knowledge and understandings, even if they are hard to articulate. The wise leader understands the difficulties that other people face and how that might affect their contribution to the team. Their effective communication, therefore, is more listening than telling. 
Let us consider the vitality or the life force of a leader because leadership can drain a person's resources, leaving them incapable of properly attending to the needs of their followers and their organisation. A leader becomes depleted when their own psychological well-being runs down. Two factors that deplete a leader are depressive symptoms and anxiety. Depressive symptoms such as feeling sad, sleeping poorly, not thinking clearly, losing interest, or feeling negatively about oneself can develop when leaders become overwhelmed with work and family difficulties. Feelings of anxiety can occur when leaders face difficult deadlines or seemingly unsolvable problems. People with anxiety worry excessively about everyday issues. This can be the cause or result of biases in information processing, which happens when people pay greater attention to threatening stimuli than is warranted, or have a biased memory of threatening events. This can lead to leaders catastrophizing, that is, assuming the worst will happen. Leaders who experience depression or high anxiety, an element of neuroticism, will not be displaying the signs of leadership in word or action. Leaders with depleted resources display lower levels of transformational leadership and are more likely to become abusive. To avoid such depletion, leaders need to develop resilience. Resilience can be understood as our immune system to cope with the hardships and exhaustion that are inevitable in life. In fact, when people properly cope with these difficulties, they develop even more resilience for future struggles. Resilience has been described by Glenn Richardson, Professor of Health Promotion and Education at the University of Utah, as a process of disruption and reintegration. At the core of resilience is a sense of connectedness, which is also essential for authenticity, a characteristic of the wise person. This connectedness can be explained in psychological and spiritual terms, depending on the way you view life. Connectedness is an understanding that all things are connected by an underlying life force, or if you want to take a biological view, a web of life. Chinese Taoist philosophy proposes that all things are connected with a flow of energy, termed qi. People need to create peace within themselves to allow the life force to flow. Ken Wilber, an American who devised integral psychology, talks of the great chain of being. Hardships and disruption alienate us from this connectedness leaving us feeling vulnerable. To overcome this, we should allow our natural self-nurturing, which is often buried under duress, to be acknowledged. Then we can take steps to feel safe, feel loved and be nurtured again. Playfulness and humour help us to re-establish that. A wise person is likely to develop resilience because he or she sees the world in a unitary sense, has the transcendent capacity to step back and reevaluate, and has the humility to realise when it is time to be kind to oneself.